Good. Good. Are we ready, Kelly? You may begin. Thank you. Good day, all. I am Dr. Arian Tatum, Assistant Professor at Coppin State University. And today we continue the conversation on diversity, equity, and inclusion in higher education. We will have two dynamic men here to share their insights, thoughts, and ideas on DEI. One of the comments from last time, and we received a lot, a lots of comments from the first town hall that we um, put on, but one of the comments that we received from the town hall was that the introductory comments were too long <laughs> and it decreased the time for uh, actual discussion. Taking heed to that comment, we will post the bios of both of our presidents in the chat. But before we begin, I would like to thank Coppin State University for virtually hosting this event. Our Director of Digital User Experience, Kelly Jackson, will assist me with monitoring the virtual environment. I am delighted to introduce President Anthony Jenkins of Coppin State University. He is here to welcome us all and wish us well as we dig into such a rich topic and discussion on DEI. Dr. Jenkins, thank you for taking the time to be with us this evening. Thank you, Dr. Tatum. It is a pleasure to be with you and to all of those who are joining us uh, to really engage in this wonderful conversation. Um, and I want to thank you for uh, hosting. I want to welcome everyone to the beautiful virtual campus of Coppin State University. Uh, it would obviously, we wish you could have been here on our campus in person, but we will eventually get to that and uh, it will be a wonderful event. You know, listen, this I think is a great opportunity to engage in a very important discussion in a very important time in our nation. And I don't think you could have picked two better presidents to engage in this conversation, to share their ideas and their insight um, on where we should be going with DEI and what does it mean to institutions of higher education and how it plays a role and really how we shape the next generation of leaders. Um, so, you know, I am, I am I'm excited uh, to hear what they are, they are going to be talking about, um, but I'm equally as excited that Coppin State University is hosting this wonderful event. So I wanted to welcome everyone. I wanted to say thank you. I wanna uh, wish everyone well. I hope that in these uh, times that your families and your loved ones are doing well. And lastly, before I go, uh, Dr. Tatum, let me congratulate you on recently becoming Dr. Tatum, uh, as we are all committed to lifelong learning in higher education. And you are a great example of that. So uh, have a wonderful um, evening, have a wonderful discussion. And I look forward to uh, hearing these two intellectual minds uh, increase all of our IQs. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, President Jenkins. I know you are so busy and I appreciate you popping in as always to get us started. Thank you so much, sir. And you made it, President Rabowski. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> We were sweating a little bit, but there you are. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay, so to keep the session organized and structured, after the questions are asked, each president will have two to three minutes to address the question. We will have one minute for the president who answered first to either reiterate or respond or rebuttal or what have you. Um, our topic, of course, is diversity, equity, and inclusion, and our questions will come from the following areas as it relates to higher education. So we're going to talk a bit about curriculum, faculty diversity, and locating diverse candidates. We're going to talk about inclusion and equity as it relates to both students, faculty, and staff. So I will take questions from our virtual audience via the Q&A section of Zoom. Uh, if you, you know, if you'll remember, there was a survey that asked um, participants if you had additional questions. And I will also take some of those questions from that survey from the last town hall. So for our audience today, 
if you can think of any questions as we're going through and you know we're speaking with President White and President Rabowski, um, just pop those questions into the Q&A area. And Dr. Lorinda Naylor, who is the Associate Professor and Program Director of the Policy, Politics and International Affairs from um, University of Baltimore will help with the Q&A section. So sometimes you might hear Dr. Naylor come in with a question as it relates to the topic at hand. So gentlemen, shall we begin? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Okay, so the links to both presidents' bios can be found in the chat. Um, I will briefly highlight the following. So both of you are presidents of USM universities, President Rabowski from UMBC and President White from Salisbury University. And you also have in common that you will be leaving us soon. So mm -hmm. we're very sad. So we had to call you here <laughs> to have you leave us with some of your wisdom, okay? <laughs> so both of you have extensive careers in science as well that I read. So before becoming college presidents, that was your area of focus. You have won countless awards and have received many accolades from near and far. So President White, you are a professor of chemistry and an expert in chemical explosions. That's amazing. I mean, I feel like we could just talk about that, but of course we're not here to talk about that. <laughs> what you have done is open your university's Center for Equity and Justice and Inclusion, and you also reestablished the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Um, so Salisbury's campus now has the National Center for Civic Reflection. So that's awesome. You've done some amazing things in your tenure there. President Rabowski, research and publications, we thank you so much for all you've done with, with your focus on science, math, and education with a special emphasis on minority participation and performance. Mm -hmm. So some, somewhere along the way, you both became interested in our topic and focus on, and that's the focus of this town hall. So what we're gonna do is take two minutes to um, talk about your extensive and impactful careers. And if you can tell us just some lessons learned, learned and insights on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you know, we've also started to hear this word belongingness as well, right? So can you share um, what would be helpful to other universities as lessons learned? And we can start with um, President White. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, um, I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizers and CUSIF for the invitation to be here. And um, I especially appreciate uh, the ability to share a, a small part of the spotlight with Freeman Herbowski. Um, we couldn't have had uh, different childhoods <laughs> growing up. I, I don't know if everybody on this uh, Zoom is aware, but in 1963, Freeman was in Birmingham, Alabama as uh, a, a leader in uh, the Children's March in Birmingham. And um, uh, for that honor, he got to spend a little bit of time in jail. And um, at, while Freeman was engaged in the civil rights movement, I was a little boy growing up in a middle-class white family, uh, and our experiences uh, just could not have been more different. But I think, as happens with many people, our lives uh, came closer together uh, with time. And uh, uh, even though uh, there's some opportunity to, for um, uh, discussion and I think the word rebuttal was used, I think you're going to find that Freeman and I are pretty much on the same page. Yeah. And I, I just wanted to say that many years ago, I had the privilege of listening to a presentation that Freeman gave uh, to, the, um, to a conference of the Council of Graduate Schools. And he talked about um, participation and engagement and success of African American students in STEM fields. And I was impressed and I've been a fan ever since. So thank you Freeman for sharing the stage with me today. Um, to get to your question, uh, finally, um, 
I have long uh, believed that every university must be a champion for economic prosperity and for social justice. And so that has driven some of the things that uh, I have done at Salisbury University as president. Um, I have to say that uh, creating the Center for Equity, Justice and Inclusion was actually a student idea. Um, the students worked through uh, shared governance, through the Student Government Association and our shared governance consortium committee structure uh, to advocate for the center. Um, but, uh, you know, as the committee of students, faculty and staff exchanged ideas on what should go in the center and how it should be operated, the administration got on board and we identified uh, space and provided some resources uh, to open the center. And so the SU Center for Equity, Justice and Inclusion is an example of the shared governance structure in higher education working to support the needs of the campus community. It is critical. Uh, particularly for public institutions, that we serve the needs of our campus community, as well as the broader community where we're located. Um, certainly, uh, the Center for Adjust Equity, Justice, and Inclusion does that through community programming and supporting the creation of communities for underrepresented or under-resourced groups. The Dave and Patsy Rommel Center for Entrepreneurship is another example, a different example of our commitment to our local community in the region. That center is actually not located on our campus. It's in downtown Salisbury on Main Street, and it supports our community and region in two major ways. Uh, first, it provides space, resources, and expertise to members of our community who are looking to start a new business or expand an existing small business. And these can be students or members of the community. Uh, it, it serves both needs. Um, but furthermore, we facilitate the process of getting others to invest in these businesses, at least to the point where they're uh, just getting started. This promotes economic development in the region as these businesses create new jobs and become engaged in the marketplace. And uh, of the 82 uh, or so businesses that have uh, been started as a result of uh, our efforts, 46 have really taken off and have generated about $20 million uh, worth of um, uh, annual funding and, and jobs uh, in our region. So through these uh, two centers, as well as other centers in our community, uh, it's clear that donors and alumni and members of the community have just as much interest in supporting these special opportunities as our students and our employees. They provide a way for us to engage both internally and externally. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Excellent. Awesome, thank you. President Rabowski. So let me start by saying that Chuck and I have so much in common, more than he may know, our, all of our parents were teachers. Let me start there. There's something to be said about that. When, you, when you're the son or, of a, or daughter of a teacher, you got this great respect for education and what teachers do at different levels. And interestingly enough, and Anthony will appreciate this, the year that uh, Chuck finished UVA was my first year as dean at Coffin State. <laughs> I was called the boy dean. I was 26 as Dean of Arts and Sciences, uh, and that term was not meant affectionately, the, uh, but my students loved me, they did. But let me say several things about equity and inclusion. And first, Chuck, congratulations on the record, on your record at Salisbury. You've made a big difference in a short amount of time with a stellar background from UVA to Caltech, chemistry, but social justice. And Anthony, thanks for what you're doing at my beloved coffin. I call it that because I was there for 10 years. Here's what I would say very briefly. When we think about equity and inclusion, there's several things to think about. One, we, we need to think about the traditional areas, about race. Race still matters. It really does. Whether we're talking about Blacks or Hispanics, Latinos, Latinx, or the Asian population and discrimination there. We have to talk about LGBTQ. We have to talk about women, for example people from other parts of the world. So there are all kinds of, we talk about international and domestic diversity, but the, the major point for me and for my campus, for my colleagues is, are we, are we treating people fairly? Are we representing the larger population? Do we have numbers of students from these different groups on our campus, a percent of black students, uh, Latinx and others, 
and and how are they doing both academically and then about their experience what would they say is the experience a good one are we making them feel proud to be there are they represented in our population as mainstream one of my articles with colleagues was on a theory of change talking about the need to pull these marginalized groups into the mainstream of the core and that's where they're talking about black students on the campus or talking about faculty i was privileged to chair the um uh, the, the committee and became the pi of our advanced program for women in science because of the, the paucity of women in science. So whether we're talking about gender or race or the other types of diversity, the question is, are they well represented on the campus, faculty, staff, and students? And number two, how are they doing? Are faculty going ahead to get tenure? Are students graduating as we'd want them? Are there major gaps right there? And, and, and most important for this group, the big question, as I say in an Atlantic article, when thinking about structural racism is, have we diversified the faculty and all those faculty having a substantive and positive experience? Let me stop there and we can keep going. That's amazing because we're gonna to touch on all of those points, exactly what you and President White just, just kind of outlined. We're gonna talk about that. So um, let's get to my next question. It's, that was kind of like a, a part two. So we've had seismic shifts in higher education, right? Um, some campuses are not seeing um, traditional students where some are seeing like loads and tons of, of traditional students. There've been numerous shifts in, um, in, la in the landscape of higher education including the cost of education um, of a college degree, that's increased, right? We're talking about now the value of a college degree. Um, let's see. We're talking about um, how the classroom has transformed from face-to-face -to, -face to virtual. That's like one of the biggest things because a lot of universities weren't prepared to do that while others were. Um, there's also um, instances of student diversity via um, race and ethnicity, and that's increased. And there are more non-traditional students, as I mentioned. They, there may be more cha uh, changes that you guys can identify. Um, but where do you see higher education? Um, I, we've written here 10 to 15 years, but I mean, it, it might be even valid to talk about the next five years, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, how, however you see fit, five to 15 years, you know, what, what does that look like to you? And also, how can faculty and administrators best adapt to these changes and shifts? Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Robowski? Sure. I think about enrollment first, because certain institutions are having enrollment challenges, community colleges, and a number of private institutions and a lot of places are. In our system, a number of campuses were having some challenges uh, for several reasons. One, uh, this COVID experience and the other challenges we face with economic disparities, all those experiences have led to a lot of families uh, struggling to send their, their children to school and families with adults wanting to go to college. So the big issue about access for students, access and success is one for and let me just say we talk about race but i want to talk about first generation college students also they fit into that diversity and equity it's very important and i would say one of the the future trends will be looking at these different populations to understand the particular issues we face with them as we think about women in the paucity of women in computing for example or as we think about first generation and Pell Grant students who may not be succeeding or we think about African Americans in predominantly white universities and how they're doing the, the point will be institutions that will succeed will bring greater specificity to their look at different groups and to the strategies they use and they won't assume they know people because black does not mean does not mean black just as latino doesn't mean latino my black students who are from the islands are very different from my black students from new york or from dc or from baltimore you know so being able to bring that specificity using technology but in all that let me final point the institutions that will succeed will be those who can show they authentically care both about the students but also about faculty and staff because if you can get that caring environment, a culture of caring, then they can work together to work through the problems. That's excellent. President Wright, White, sorry, I knew I was going to do that. <laughs> uh, I, I agree completely. And um, a part of what we try to do in, at 
every university is to make sure that people not only feel welcome at our university, but develop a true sense of belonging. Yeah. Um, now that the seismic shifts, um, as I think you pointed out, uh, we're not questioning the ability to, of our faculty to adapt uh, to seismic shifts. Uh, I think that uh, they have shown uh, remarkable resilience uh, in the face of the pandemic and in keeping up uh, the quality, the high quality of education at our institutions. Um, certainly new changes and challenges are on the horizon. There are commercial education businesses that are encroaching on many of the more financially sustainable parts of the higher education business. Um, but I am confident that uh, in general, we are well prepared to adjust accordingly. And with that said, um, this is a really great question and, and your premise is spot on. Our students are coming to us with more varied levels of preparation. And it's very important that we put the resources and structure in place for them all to be successful. One of the difficulties with that is, as you know, every student and each situation is different. Um, I am a strong believer in looking beyond uh, GPA and test scores and making sure that an opportunity for higher education is available to those who really want it. Um, but we can't set, up, set students up for failure and uh, send them away without a diploma, um, par possibly saddled with debt. Um, when we accept a student at SU, we are dedicated to the long game. And it is our responsibility to provide appropriate support to allow every student to gain a great education, to graduate and to become a contributing and engaged citizen of the world. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, let me just add, I mean, because I, I like what Chuck said, the, the fact is that one of the advantages of the University System of Maryland is we do have this Cuff group this, and the, the, with the faculty council and Elizabeth does a very good job of bringing to the attention of the board and the presidents what faculty members are saying. And one of the challenges we face in American higher education and in our state is that while we do a fine job with many students, a large proportion of students don't succeed, whether it's 30 or 40 percent or more than that at some institutions. And as I say, and my colleagues and I say in my book, The Empowered University, how do we look in the mirror itself? And I, I, I applaud Cusp for raising this question, because you're saying we're not meeting the needs of all our students right now. Institutions are doing a good job with a lot of students, but we can all do a better job. Uh, and the question becomes, how do we understand those backgrounds? The fact is that looking at our state and the changing demographics, a large percentage of Maryland's children cannot read well when they graduate from high school. That's a big issue. It really is. We don't know how bad, much of an issue. And as a math person, I'm more concerned about the reading skills than anything else. Because if a child can read, my fellow my STEM person, chemist knows, if you can read, you can teach them how to do word problems. But if you can't read and think, you know, and I'm saying we as a system have to look at that in terms of our big population of people coming to us. We get people from other states, but the vast majority are coming from the state. They're more and more of color, more and more kids who are from low income backgrounds, and their skills are not where they need to be. And we're gonna need the support of faculty um, and to support faculty in working even more closely with K through 12 to build up backgrounds if those young people are gonna have a chance of succeeding. Because the real question that's a hard one to answer is, if I'm 17 years old and I go to college and I'm reading at the seventh grade level, how long would it take me to get up to a point of being able to succeed in college. That's, I mean, just a big question. Not even get to the math, just the reading. So that's a piece of what we need to think about. And that's a policy decision about how we can bring expertise to the K-12 system to help with that issue. Just another point. No, that's an amazing point. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. White. White, did you want to say something? <laughs> no, yeah. I, oh, okay. I, I agree completely. Oh, <laughs> may I, okay. May I do like my fellow president and take my tie off. It would oh, make of course. <laughs> he looks so much more cool than I do. Wait a minute. Thank you. Wait. <laughs> and I want oh, to follow boy. the young people. And to me, Chuck is young. So I'll follow him. <laughs> 
that is okay. It's after five o'clock, right? You go for it. <laughs> but you all should have been offering a little. You should have been offering a little champagne as we're talking. Oh, you know, I could have done that. I, I was there yesterday. I could have done that. <laughs> Go right ahead. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so it's it's amazing that you mentioned the the K through twelve um, kind of pipeline that we have going on. And if you're following the local news in Baltimore, you will notice they they do this project Baltimore for schools and things like that. And they are talking about how, uh, and I don't have the, the correct percentages, but it is an alarming percentage of students that cannot read. Um, and I do believe one of one of the high schools was like 99%. They were not reading on a high school level. And that is extremely alarming. So as a faculty member to have to, you know, um, you know, help a student at this particular, you know, magnitude that, um, you know, they, they're not, they're not ready. They're not prepared. And that is scary. So with that said, what do we do with this? <laughs> you know, what do we do with this? Where in five years, where are we going to go? Do you think that this pipeline will change in five years? Or if you don't think it'll change, um, how long do you think it'll take? You know, th let me just check it back and say this. We've got this we are a microcosm of the country. And so we have some of the best prepared students of all races in some of our schools, in some of our counties. And then we have some of the least well-prepared students. We've got this big gap. It's the achievement gap that we talk about. And that gap is gonna continue to grow because people who are privileged and from well-educated families will make sure their children get a really good education. Um, but people who don't have that support and who may not have that, and they, even though we're one of the best educated city, states in the union, still only about 40% of our citizens have a college education. Now that's 10% above the national average, but still we're talking about the majority not coming from college educated families. We, I think faculty need support in whatever we do. Number one, faculty are already loaded. There are some great programs at our institutions, Chuck and others involving K through 12 right now, I know that. Uh, I think that we have the opportunity as a system to talk with the state about how we can have more funds as we talk about the current commission so that we look at the role of universities in helping with that because we've got that expertise there and we need that. We can't do just more and more without more support. I know that. But when you have the resources, you can be more involved in the process and we're going to need that to be able to keep this level of education we have and to make it even more. That would be one of the things I would say. Before I came to Salisbury, I worked for another institution, which was an open admissions institution. Uh, it played uh, not only the four-year role uh, of a regional comprehensive university, but also the community college role at the same time. So if you got a, a high school diploma, you were automatically admitted uh, to that institution. And that was challenging. The, the graduation rate from uh, that institution was only half what it is at Salisbury University. And we worried a lot about the preparation of students for college level work. And as Freeman mentioned, uh, when it comes to uh, remedial or developmental education, um, math and English are fundamental. Yeah to the success of everything. And you can't address the math part until you've addressed the English part. Right. Uh, because without that, you may be able to figure out that two plus two is four, but you can't apply that knowledge to right. real uh, problems. Yeah. And so uh, we did a lot of experiments uh, to work with small groups of, of students who uh, were, um, who had attributes that predicted that they would not do uh, very well uh, in college. And some of those were successful, but unfortunately, a lot of the success depends on the passion of the person who is running the project or teaching the class. And so, yes, we need a lot of resources. Yes, we need a lot of money, but also we need a lot of passion. Sure. Uh, no, in order to be successful. At, at, at anybody who's excellent at anything has passion, whether it's in the arts or it's in the sciences. I would say uh, that, that the K through 12 issue is just one we need to acknowledge that we can be working on as a system and others grants 
that bring in that can bring in money because it takes resources to do extra stuff. It just does, right? Um, and we we've got solid faculty on all of our campuses. I would say I want to address one other issue that we talked about on the other end, and that is as we talk about diversifying the faculty, I think that we as a system can do more to prepare more people who will be becoming a part of the professoriate in different in different you know and i you know we are doing it in the science as well now we lead the country producing these blacks who are going to get phds in science and they're going on faculties from the woman who did the vaccine i keep saying that who's not at harvard kiss me get corporate first black woman but but let me say this and all of our campuses can point to our graduates who've gone on to do well we have the opportunity to produce students of color who will go on to phds in the social sciences, in the humanities, in the social sciences. I was really delighted to talk with the, new, the upcoming new provost at Frostburg, because I was really proud because she got a start at Coppin State and has been down in the, in the University of Florida system. And she's uh, kudos to Ron and his team, but she's African-American provost at Frostburg. It's a great story. And she comes out of our system. It's a wonderful story, right? I'm just saying that I would ask faculty on all the campuses to identify students of color, first generation college students who you see with some passion, who've got that potential, many have the potential, but where you can really see if I just work with them and just to say to them, you know, you could have my job one day. You could be a professor because in most of our institutions, except for the HBCUs, you're going to have many, far fewer people of color. That's around the country. We know that, right? But we have the chance on all of our campuses to produce more people of color who, who do well enough at the bachelor's level, they can go and get PhDs either from some of our campuses or from other campuses. And I would, I would ask, that's one thing in particular faculty can do, help us produce more people for the professoriate, whether in the social sciences, the arts, humanities, or the sciences. That's one specific, by identifying people. And as my TED talk says, if you can build a community of people, not just of color, but others, who have as a, as a goal becoming professors, Mm -hmm. That is very exciting. It really is. Even if it's just five who say one day we're going to take their jobs. We're going to be professors in chemistry or whatever the area and areas are. And I, I, we see that with the Meyerhoff, but we see it with the humanities scholars and others and bringing more people of color to those groups who will think of themselves not as going to law school necessarily, no offense to law school, but as getting a PhD. Often students of color have never seen somebody with a PhD in that discipline, black, for example, or Latino. When you see the person, you say, well, maybe I could do it. That, that would be my suggestion. No, that's that's amazing. And I, and I love that that's full circle, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. you had someone from Coppin to go yeah. outside of the system to come back into the system. That's amazing. Yeah. And I do think um, it's, 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 it's really important to let students know that they can be more than they are and more than what they see. Yes. That, that's an amazing point yeah. that you both made. Um, okay, oh my goodness. Dr. Taylor, one of the points yeah. for faculty, you know, I was just reading, when I was reading uh, President White's, Chuck's bio, I didn't know, I knew he was a chemist. I didn't know that he wasn't just UVA, but Caltech. Wait, yeah. wait, number one. And I didn't know that he had been for decades at University of Utah. What am I saying? As a Southerner, I can say this, and he, Virginia, you'll appreciate this. We must tell our stories. Yeah. We must tell our stories. You hear me with mine, with Birmingham and all that. But I'm saying each of us can inspire students mm -hmm. by telling our stories that we were not always as certain and sure of ourselves, that there were times when we were insecure, you know, mm -hmm. or times when we got knocked down, right? And we got back up, right? So another thing for faculty, please tell your story because everybody's story can inspire somebody else. Just another and you sometimes don't even know that you're in inspiring someone else. That's exactly right. Because right. you know, I tell my story all the time to my students and they're like, yeah. oh my gosh, I can't believe that. And I'm like, yeah. wow, you yeah. got that from that? All right, yeah. yay. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. The only thing I would add, Freeman, is that as leaders and mentors, and this is for administrators and faculty, uh, after graduation, uh, we have a responsibility to stay mentors and to help open doors oh, yeah. for people oh, to oh, have oh, opportunity. Oh, and that is so wise. We use the term now, we say mentors, but the next level for me is becoming a champion mm -hmm. or an advocate. Mentors are wonderful and they can advise and you go to your mentor. A champion will be intrusive. If they see you're not doing something right, they're gonna say, wait a minute, you gotta work on this, right? Or an advocate. And they, as he said it so well, you knock down doors 
and you say, why isn't this person being considered for that job? We, as faculty, we can do that. I think it's such an important point. Thank you, Chuck. Very yeah. important. Point. And we're going to get into that. We're definitely going to get into faculty and how to diversify faculty and all of those good things. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about how hard. So we we understand that our faculty are working hard. They're doing the most with not a lot. Right. <laughs> and they're doing this to ensure an optimal learning environment for students. And they hope that students succeed and they hope that they graduate and that they actually become employed right in the field of their study. Um, one of our last town hall audience members agreed that curriculum and pedagogy are huge topics that would be worth talking about. And also student mentoring, which we just mentioned for minorities and marginalized groups. Um, we talked a bit about this, um, how universities can become more student centered to ensure students graduate. Yeah. Um, and let's let's talk a little bit. Well, I think we already kind of covered this, but what um, administrators and faculty could do differently. Um, if you wanted to say a bit more about that, that's fine. But if not, I can move on. We always have plenty we can say, Chuck, you go first. Then I'll go. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Presidents well, are like it, politicians. We can always talk. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> it, it really is very closely tied to the last question, but yeah. I think communication um, from faculty and staff here is really important. Um, the administration can see trends and we can see data, but um, you all get a sense for what's happening much faster than the faculty do than, than we do. And generally speaking, the faculty have a better understanding of what's causing less than optimal learning environments. Uh, we need to hear what the faculty and, and sometimes what the staff are seeing. Uh, that's where it's uh, very important that we support faculty and staff development in order to provide that support to our students. At SU, um, a, Part of our support through faculty is through uh, structured faculty development experiences, such as our annual teaching and learning conference. Um, but we also have informal discussions between students and faculty. And uh, just last week, um, CUSIP secretary Ellen Schaefer Salins partnered with the director of our Disability Resource Center to host a screening of uh, the film Crip Camp uh, and had a follow up session with Judy Hoyman, uh, who's a nationally known disability rights advocate. So that sort of direct um, uh, conversation with students is a really important way uh, that the institution can um, learn about uh, what we need to do to support students. Mm -hmm. That's good. Can I ask a quick follow up question, Dr. White? So yeah. do you find that the avenues that you have to hear from faculty and staff, as you say, do you think they're effective? Or could there be something more done? So there are many ways to, to do this. And um, sometimes uh, just having uh, relationships with faculty, with the faculty senate uh, can accomplish part of it. But honestly, what, what I do uh, quite often is just go down and have lunch in our dining commons. And I pick out an unsuspecting group of students and I just sit down with them and I ask them what's what. And I learn a lot from, from the students directly uh, about what's going on. I think it's really important for presidents and provosts and, and vice presidents uh, to be doing this, to be getting out of their offices and walking across campus and teaching classes and having lunch at the commons and uh, visiting with students in the uh, um, student union. All of that uh, is important uh, for figuring out what's going on. I love that. Yeah. And Dr. I Tatum. Oh, yes. Dr. Naylor, sure. I, I, I will uh, let uh, President Hebrowski first. Okay, yes, sir. You wanna go first? You can go first, Dr. Naylor. Okay, um, I just wanted to share with you that we had a question from the audience. Um, uh -huh. Would you be receptive to taking it now? Certainly. Sure. Okay, um, we have a question and it reads, my colleagues and I are currently researching decolonization of curriculum to support equity in education, such as relevant content related to structural and institutional racism and the impact on their lives. Can you provide suggestions that would support a systematic process to decolonize curricula? I think that uh, let me let me go to the other question and it'll be related to that one. Uh, I was going to suggest, in addition to what Chuck said, that uh, we have these Rabowski Innovation Grants that they started for my 20th anniversary, and we raised money to have 
an endowment to give faculty opportunities to apply for innovation focused on the needs of students in redesigning courses. Mm. And I think they get 25,000 and we do quite a few each year across the disciplines. Um, I didn't want it to be called Rybowski Innovation Grants because I think you're, you're supposed to be almost dead when they name things after you, but they did it anyway. <laughs> but the, um, uh, the key is this, that, uh, and some of those grants have been in areas involving social justice and race and interdisciplinarity from computing to history to working on um, uh, the, the area involving the Freddie Gray, that area of Baltimore City and how the War of 1861 was fought in that area and over similar issues involving racism and, and poverty and discrimination. And we developed, it was game development uh, that could help students and high school students as an example of an innovation grant, connecting computer science history with social justice. Uh, but, but this is what I would say. Uh, we have several grants right now. And grants, one of the ways you can do more of this is when there are resources. Resources, faculty know this, make such a difference. If you either have release time or a grant to do something, you can do something extra from what you're already doing, in addition to the service you may be giving. And so we've had several grants from the Mellon Foundation focused on a diversity and curriculum uh, as one in our humanities center. And the most recent one involving Morgan and College Park involved diversity of the faculty and building leadership among people of color and women and what that would mean. But I do think that looking at some of the approaches to curriculum review and assessment that have been done on some of our campuses in recent years can be very helpful. We, for example, went through a process of looking at those courses, those courses involving race gender, racism, structural justice, social, I mean, structural discrimination, and, and have had some very substantive conversations. I would say it needs to be an ongoing, evolving process. One can continue to learn from that. We've also done a lot with professional development because in some areas, the humanities and social sciences, going back to the Freddie Gray days, um, faculty were able to have those conversations and to look at how they were teaching things. In other departments, they said, we have not been trained to do this. And so we've had a lot of professional development on how you focus on these issues. If it's not a part of your expertise, how would you know? You know? And people can sometimes be really um, anxious about going into an area where they have not been given that support or that development. When you talk about race, racism, structural discrimination in different ways, there is a body of, of knowledge and literature that's there. And, Everybody has not been prepared to do that, and particularly through different lenses, through different disciplines. So the idea of professional development coupled with curriculum review uh, and with departments working together, given that there are always challenges involving turf, turf, we know that, let's be honest, and that even though we talk about interdisciplinarity as silos, certain oh my courses, goodness, yes. <laughs> certain courses are the pur purview of certain departments, and the one thing I would say is that it does take building trust among colleagues, not only between administration and faculty, but across departments to yes. be willing to look at those issues. And it's not going to happen overnight. It is a multi-year process. Those yeah. Are yeah, Dr. White. I'm sorry, President White. <laughs> Chuck. Maybe even Chuck. <laughs> you already know I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so as a as a chemist as a as a chemistry professor early in my career I spent a large part of my professional effort worrying about the behaviors of molecules rather than worrying about the behaviors of people and you might think as I once did uh, that there isn't much intersection between DEI and chemistry or math because there's nothing in most math or chemistry textbooks about race or ethnicity or gender identity or ability. But it's important for all of us to understand that racism is endemic to all of higher education in this country. And it's pretty easy in retrospect to understand why this is the case. Every faculty member I know considers themselves to be a successful person and an expert in their chosen field. And that's mostly true. So it's understandable that most of us want 
often subconsciously, we want our students to emulate us so that they too can become su successful professionals. So when we mentor students, and sometimes when we recruit scholars to join our faculty, we sometimes fall into the trap of trying to find someone who represents a good fit uh, to the existing structure. Uh, we value collegi collegiality and that uh, tends to decrease um, the amount of objectivity that we uh, take in our decisions. Um, so uh, all in all this, uh, tends to keep white people uh, and white men, particularly in positions of power and authority in higher education, even in, and I might say, especially in fields like chemistry and math and physics and, and engineering. So these are some of the ways that structural or institutional racism persists in our universities. So the question is, um, what can we do about it? What um, what are some of the strategies for avoiding this, uh, especially in the curriculum? And I think the answer is going to be different in almost every uh, discipline, but in chemistry, where, where I'm most familiar with uh, the problem, uh, one of the successful approaches uh, that many people have taken is to put a greater focus on group work and project uh, work. Right. And that takes the focus off of individuals and uh, has people working collaboratively in groups. And I think what that can do is is to help uh, increase our objectivity when it comes to the relationships that we have with students and the mentoring that we do. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Um, oh, did you have something else, Dr. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Tatum, we have a question from um, our president of the Council of University System Faculty. Okay. Um, Elizabeth Brunn, and her question is, many of the points made have focused on the younger student. How can we apply these ideas to make connections with the older student who have also come in a variety of educational backgrounds? Well, you know, I, I would say, first of all, if you show me a campus that's, that's looking at performance of students and listening to the voices of students, then that campus understands, Elizabeth, that we have to disaggregate the data and talk to different groups. Uh, we have the two strategies we use for understanding the student perspective and faculty perspective would be uh, analytics, just looking at what, what will the data tell us? Who's getting tenure, for example, or right. who's leaving the university? What groups might be leaving disproportionately? And then secondly, how are they doing, how are the students doing, and by groups, for example, returning students, all of our campuses have more returning students um, and then listen, whether they're veterans or others, and then listening to their voices about what they say. We also in, in our in our women's center, those are primarily returning women who often have kids or families. And so I get a chance to go in and meet with them and to listen to their concerns and what they say goes well. We want to know both. We want to know what are we doing well and what can we improve on? It's very important. And and the other thing I would say is that having people on the faculty and the staff who have become advocates for those groups can be very important. There are people not only in our women's center, but others on the campus. And we brought in grant money from different foundations to work with returning students to give them additional support and to look at. And then our new finish line program is, is all about returning students from late 20s to the 40s who never graduated. And we brought them back and we have focus groups with them to understand what would it take for them to finish that last 12 credits or whatever. And we learn a great deal from those groups. But let me go back for a minute because something that Chuck said is so important. We, we tend to think about decolonization or looking at issues of discrimination, racism, sexism in the humanities and social sciences. Those areas are very important. In fact, they're at the heart of our curriculum as we think about who we are as human beings and how we treat each other. But there are far more ways to involve um, the STEM areas, as Chuck was saying, besides the group work and those things, which I think are very important. For example, people think of math or stat as simply being objective or that, you know, it's just, it is math. It's not the case at all. It really isn't. The assumptions that we make, um, the ways in which we will use samples. Um, the perfect example we're using these days involves 
the the biology major who also connected to the social sciences, and that's my my producer of the vaccine, uh, Dr. Corbett, had to really make it clear to her team she was not ready to move ahead with the Moderna vaccine study until she had enough people of color, blacks in particular and Latinos, in the sample in the study. Because her point was, if you don't, if you don't have them in the study, then you cannot convince people that this works for me. But she learned that through her work in sociology and working in Baltimore City, not just in the lab, but with groups involving the distrust that we see. So there are ways data science is a perfect example that's at the intersection of computation, statistics, and the social sciences. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see more and more opportunities for people in the STEM areas, not everybody, but some who want to see how we can bring in these social justice issues that Chuck is talking about. Thank you. President White, do you want to respond to um, Dr. Brunt's question as well? Um, yeah, I, I agree with uh, what Freeman said. You know, it's, it is really important that we teach our students not to just to be uh, mathematicians or statisticians, but whole people. And yeah. that's the way that we're going to bring in some of these really important factors that he did. Right. So I will say this. I must tell you that in earlier years, we had complaints from returning students that all of us, uh, some faculty, some staff, some administrators were treating a 35-year-old as if she is a 19-year-old. And we had to rethink our mindset of who's in the classroom. Because somebody who's been out with life does not want to be treated like a teenager. And sometimes we don't even think about it. Uh, and uh, it did help us. We went through a lot of training to, to understand it, a lot of conversations about what does it mean to make sure we're respectful of the 19 year old but there's another kind of respect for somebody who's 40 because mm -hmm. of what they've gone through you know what i mean and it doesn't just happen it does take a mindful approach to make sure our policies and our approaches in and out of the classroom are respectful of that person coming with life experiences yeah I definitely experienced that because my degree that I teach at Coppin is, you know, usually people come in and they're um, going into like a second career. Yeah, um, I do. I have students that are older than me. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they have kids that, <laughs> that might be older than me, you know, yeah. so I have to yeah. I have to respect that. And I appreciate the way that they respect me. Yeah. So, yes, that is something that I definitely have to face. Now, when we had the conversation at Coppin about diversity, equity and inclusion, um, it was it was interesting because someone wrote that, you know, we're HBCU. We don't have problems with diversity, equity and inclusion. And then that kind of sparked a whole thing like, oh, yes, we do. If it's not, you know, like the the light skin versus dark skin or the, you know, the professional doctorate versus the Ph.D. or it's the isms, it's the ageism, the sexism and all those okay. kinds of things. So okay. I'm going to move on to that particular point. Mm -hmm. So student bodies at campuses across the country are becoming more diverse. And we've been talking about that. So gender, race, ethnicity, um, and here's some facts. Um, females have represented the majority of bachelor earning adults since 1982, with females earning 57% of bachelor's degrees in 19, I'm sorry, in 2018. And um, since 1982, females have earned the greatest percentage of master's degrees. And since 2006, females have earned the greatest percentage of PhDs, according to the US Department of Statistics from 2019. Regarding race and ethnicity, college students are twice as likely to be black than faculty members and four times as likely to be Hispanic than faculty on average. And that's from Pew Research from 2019. The theory of representative bureaucracy by Christoph and uh, Rosenblum states that government employees such as faculty members at state universities should reflect or mirror the people or students they serve. They, there were comments from our last town hall, such as there is essentially no representation by African American scholars in my department. How do we even begin? <laughs> um, I fear that from the outside, our department doesn't look like a place of welcoming. So that's something to consider. Um, how do we do this? You know, like, how do we ensure that faculty members, staff, and administrators represent the diverse populations? Where do we find those qualified candidates to actually make this happen? 
Mm -hmm. uh, President White. I'll be honest and say this is really challenging and the work must be intentional. Um, a long time ago, a friend of mine, Al Church, uh, was the principal of a uh, charter school in Salt Lake City. And um, it was the first charter school in the state. Uh, and uh, Al's vision was for it to be a minority majority um, magnet school for math, engineering, and science. I was uh, Al's uh, higher education partner. And I asked him, how in the world are you going to do this in a place like Salt Lake City? And his answer was recruiting, recruiting, recruiting. It has got to be the most important work and the hardest work, and it has to be on the front end of, of the process. Um, there, I don't think there's any substitute for it. And so Al was willing to do that hard work. He uh, went to community meetings uh, on the west side of uh, Salt Lake City, where uh, many of the communities were Latinx uh, majority. And he recruited uh, from parents, from students, from schools, from guidance counselors. He recruited everybody. Uh, he developed a reputation for being a great school with great academic um, experiences. And, uh, you know, parents of white students would come to him and say, you know, what about our student? And, you know, it's a public school and he was uh, uh, by law required to allow everybody in. Uh, there was a lottery if there were more uh, people that wanted to get in uh, than there were slots. Um, but, um, Al succeeded in his vision of creating a minority majority uh, school on the east side of Salt Lake City by doing the hard work of recruiting. And so I think that's really uh, where it starts. Um, our Division of Academic Affairs uh, has developed uh, a comprehensive plan um, from initial faculty position request through the search process, onboarding, tenure and promotion to, and post-tenure review uh, to emphasize the importance of DEI in all of the things that we do uh, with faculty. And our faculty senate is considering, um, currently considering this recommendation to modify um, requirements for tenure and promotion that would require activities that support DEI and teaching, professional development, research and service for all, for all faculty. Um, we've worked to make searches and relocation easier for faculty and by reviewing and cl clarifying policies and procedure procedures in our faculty handbook, um, which is now in a more accessible format. And we've uh, supported new and established faculty through our membership in the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity mentoring programs, summer writing programs, faculty learning communities, and other activities. But really, I think, um, especially when you're get, getting started, uh, when you're behind the curve already, um, it amounts to doing the very hard work of recruiting. Um, I, I personally, when I hire people, I don't even begin the review process until I know that the candidate pool um, has a sufficient level of diversity that I can honestly go and just choose the best person out of that uh, candidate pool. And I can be confident that in the long run, I'm going to be successful in achieving my diversity goals. Um, and uh, that is uh, really about doing the hard work of recruiting. Mm -hmm. so let, let me add, I, I commend Chuck on that. Let me, let me say that this is one of those topics for the difficult conversations. Uh, if you get a chance to look at the article that Kate Tracy and Peter Henderson and I wrote in the Atlantic two years ago, and the title of the article is Higher Education Should Lead to Efforts to Reverse the Structural Racism. We are experts at saying what the society needs to do as a higher education system we are though resistant to for a lot of reasons making the changes we need to make and my campus and i have been we have been working on this for years and we've made some progress in some areas and not in other areas let me say that on any campus some departments will be on it more than others all right and one of our challenges is to is to keep speaking the truth without getting to the point that 
people feel so pushed that no progress is made. Because let, let me say this about shared governance. Let me say it about the professoriate. You can't make people do anything. You really can't. Because if you're going to say, you better bring or you got to bring somebody. No, because even if somebody comes in, if they're not coming in with the support of the faculty, they're not going to make it anyway. It only can work if the person coming in has the support of his colleagues, his or her colleagues. You know, and I know everybody wants to do the right thing, or so many people do. We know that. Most do. But what do we define as the right thing? You know, one of the things I said to the faculty senate uh, recently, and we have a tea every month and then the real meeting, the big meeting of all the people. And I left rushing from, from that meeting to get here to this one. The, uh, is that at one point I actually said, I'm embarrassed that we haven't made more progress because we've done a really good job with blacks in graduation rates and all of that, but we had not diversified the faculty. That was some years ago. We've done better. And, and one of the things I would say is looking at best practices we used a part of what University of Michigan had come up with uh, in our STRIDE program, S-T-R-I-D-E. Look at that program. Uh, has really helped us in the humanities, social sciences, because we bring in postdocs and give them two years to build up their research, get to know the faculty, and when it goes well, we move them into a tenure track position. That has helped us with a number of positions. Uh, and then there are other roles in the sciences that people are using. Um, and there are two things I would say. Number one, identifying pools of candidates before they even complete the PhD. Identifying people who are close to finishing a PhD and beginning to talk to them. The Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab has hundreds and hundreds of PhDs in STEM areas. The head of that program, APL, which is half of Hopkins, is um, Ralph Simmel who has his PhD from us in computer science. And he's got, he's got that spirit of bringing in more blacks and Latinos PhDs. So he began working with us with the Miles Scholars Program years ago as students were going off to grad school to give them opportunities for summer internships. And now he's got 10 to 12 blacks PhDs there in these STEM who are Miles. I was shocked when I went over there. So he started working with them early in grad school to get them thinking about research. And that is an academic research environment. We've done the same thing in some departments on our campus. Uh, and the two things I would say, it's the recruiting as Chuck says, but then it's the nurturing and support. Because when they come in as one person, it's really hard. If you've never been the only one in the group, it's really hard, it really is. And so building community, I talk about that in my TED talk for performance and science, but it's through in life. You need communities of people. We saw that with the advanced program and getting women who form communities to support each other. We need the same thing for every other group. So the report that we chaired, uh, my colleagues and I chaired for the National Academy said, we need an advanced program for faculty of color. Still trying to get in this have to do that, where you can have a community of young scholars. So you have more than one in a department. And if you only have one in the department, what are you doing to make sure that person feels welcome? and support it. It's really so the nurturing is it's getting them in and then giving them support. And then the final part is this. We were so proud for the first time we had three blacks in the last year to become full professors. Now that may not seem like a lot to y'all. It was a big deal. One in psychology, one in political science, one in language in, in language and culture. Well, one is our interim dean right now in first black dean of an academic college with the faculty and uh, doing a great job, Kimberly Moffitt, Dr. Kimberly Moffitt, who's an expert on Michelle Obama. The other two have, one has moved on to become a dean at UMass, is Dean of Arts and Humanities at UMass, UMass Boston, and the other is a, first, is a, a leading scientist at NIH. So here's the point, you, you bring these people up, you grow them, they get promoted, and then you got the challenge, they get stolen away, even when you give more money. So I'm saying it's complicated, it's not an excuse, but it's all that that has to be taken. And, and what I had to decide, let me say this with great honesty, was to give them support when they wanted to take another opportunity. Not to make them feel guilty about leaving us, right? but rather right. to say you are part of UMBC. So whether, whether they're at another university, we still see them as a part of the UMBC story. You get my point? So it's the recruiting, the nurturing, the promoting, all would be important. I appreciate that. I count that as a success, Freeman, because yeah. the, the people you really want to be a part of your institution yeah. are the people who are going to be the hardest to retain. 
Yep, yep, that's that's exactly right. And it's, you know, and in earlier years, there were times when some people were leaving because they didn't feel that support. And we worked on that. Let me be honest about that. Some departments said, no, we've got to do more to give them support. We're doing that now. You know, we can, and success is never final. We ne <laughs> you never know how a young person is feeling. Are they telling you what they really feel? Because, you know, they're worried about tenure. So it's finding ways of getting the real deal to understand how, how's it going for you. And that's why having others of color or other allies, we talk a lot about allies. The STRIDE program has some blacks and Latinos helping with recruiting, but it has a lot of whites and white men who usually are at the height of power. Almost can't. We've got some white men who become ambassadors, which is, it sounds, well, it is what it is. We know that. <laughs> That's right. that's not my being an angry black man. I'm just telling the truth. <laughs> like you, you know, you know. <laughs> no, I appreciate both of your answers, Dr. White, with being intentional, right? Yeah. And leading that effort to do that and actually taking a closer look and not trying to put, you know, blinders on your eyes and say, oh, we don't have a problem with that. And also what I heard you guys say is that um, it, it's kind of similar to the collaboration with high schools that community colleges have yeah, or yeah. with the agreements that community colleges have with, you know, bachelor's programs. So, yeah. you know, we're taking that model and we are home growing or, yeah. you know, kind of helping people into and mentoring them into these positions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, it, and we should be thinking about that. And this goes back to something Chuck said about after graduation. So our faculty are working with some of our students uh, students in general and black students who are completing grad programs as serving as champions to get them in either to the postdoc experience or into a faculty position. You yeah. know, so I mean, I mean, I think we need to think more broadly. It's our own faculty, but it's also where are your graduates going and are you helping them to get into these faculty positions at other places? I think that's a part of what we can do as faculty and administrators. Yeah, I agree with that. I do. And you both also talked about appointment, rank, and tenure, right? Yeah. That very clear, not at all confusing right. process <laughs> of, you know, attaining tenure. I'm, and, I'm joking. And then, no, no, let, me, let me say, it was our <laughs> faculty senate that helped the administration to clarify expectations. Because in some departments, young faculty knew exactly what they needed to do. And some others, me, people meaning well, just said, we'll know it when we see it. Yeah. Which was just, it was not, it was not what young faculty wanted to hear. And no. it was literally a number of women in, in uh, the executive committee of the faculty senate who said, we need help in helping mm -hmm. young faculty to be given clearer expectations of what would be expected. And we are much stronger with that now. Uh, as we think about ways of making sure when we bring people in, women, people of color, junior faculty in general, that they have a, an excellent chance of succeeding in getting tenure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Um, so talking a little bit about that, that process, um, I do have some facts and figures here from the National Center um, for Education Statistics. And as of 2017, um, universities across the country, there, of course, we know, we talked about this, there's a shortage of minority and female faculty members at all ranks, with the biggest shortage at full professorship, like you said. Um, faculty ranking increases from assistant to associate to full in the past, but there have been fewer women and minorities uh, represented. So 27% of assistant professors are minority compared to 19% of full professors. 53% of assistant professors are women compared to only 35% of full professors. So can you think of more barriers that need to be removed to increase this number? Um, to advance minorities and women in the faculty rank and salary from your perspective. And you talked about mentorships and you talked about, you know, role models and training and professional networks, but is there anything else that we're missing? The notion of family friendly. We've gotten grants to work not just with the sciences, but across the board, because one of the reasons women faculty sometimes can get tenure and don't move on, family challenges and responsibilities come up and we don't take that into account. So we've had grants to change our culture through the advanced program and others so that we give women other opportunities to um, get done what they need to do with the profession, but to take into account family situations. 
whether it's about pregnancy or a variety of other issues. And so um, we've got, I mean, our colleagues who are over those issues um, from Pat McDermott and Autumn Reed both have developed guidelines with faculty, with departments to give junior faculty. We, and what we did for women, we needed to do for men too, for junior in terms of family responsibilities and leaves and those kind of things and the tenure track clock and those things. Uh, and listening to what they say. And similarly, during COVID, we have now done some things to deal with childcare issues as people have faced those. So looking at the whole person and that family situation to see how we can be supportive as they move up the ladder, given what we know that happens to women so often. Very yeah. important. D President White? I agree that um, creating an environment where people uh, feel supported is uh, essential to this. Uh, I would add um, my own uh, sense that another thing that we have to do in order to um, make the process of promotion and tenure more equitable is to um, remove some of the subjectivity from the process. I've been at several different institutions now and they all have different uh, tenure policies, but uh, in some universities, uh, the you can have a, a wide ranging, ranging discussion uh, about the qualifications of a person who's uh, up for promotion or for tenure. But at the end of the day, it all amounts to a single vote, thumbs up or thumbs down. Mm -hmm. And that level of subjectivity um, really allows too much uh, flexibility and um, uh, opportunity for implicit bias or even explicit bias. Uh, to enter into the equation. And so I've seen other universities that have much more uh, structured processes for making tenure decisions and much more quantitative uh, uh, procedures for making tenure and promotion decisions, which I think can take some of that subjectivity out of the equation and uh, really enhance the amount of equity that we were able to include in those important decisions. I think that will be important going forward uh, for regularizing uh, the percentage of women and and uh, minorities and uh, people from underrepresented groups uh, in the professoriate. Mm -hmm. It's it points up well taken. We faculty have worked on with the administration on through shared governance on that the layers of approval at the department level, at the dean's level, at the university wide level, and external reviews, uh, external comments to see how they compare with those there as ways of doing exactly what Chuck is talking about and, and working on the definition of research itself in some departments, it's, which has been very, very important. Um, and, and the good news, and you can always determine how effective it is by looking at the disaggregated data and seeing if women and people of color are moving up the ladder. You got two points. Are there any in the process, in the pipeline? In some cases, there's nobody even there to be going up. And then when you do have them, are they making it? Are they succeeding? And every campus can say it's had some success in some areas and not in others. And, and the challenge will be to have all of us having a sense of urgency that mm -hmm. our students of all races need to see more people of a variety of backgrounds excelling in the professoriate. And you know, when we talk about more women PhDs, it's true in some disciplines. But when you get to areas like computer science, when only 20% of the bachelors in this country in computer science are women, and you look at the faculty, what you will see is that the, the, the very few small percentages of women in the professoriate in computer science, and often they will be from other countries. And we're delighted to have people from other countries. But it does send a message to young, young girls who are American. If they don't see people, I mean, in general, of every race, quite frankly, who look, who look like them who are from this country also. We need both. We need yeah. both, I would say. Agreed. Um, President White, anything to, to, to add? Well, we, we sometimes make a big deal at SU that uh, just about half of our CS graduates are women. Um, but then hardly any are black uh, or Latinx. And um, uh, we don't have nearly enough men on our faculty in nursing. So wow. yeah. You know, yeah. It, there's always work to do. Yeah, no, that's, yeah. And ours is just the opposite. We're proud that 
20 some percent of our computer science majors are black in information systems and computer science. Um, uh, and we have more women in information systems, but certainly not enough, only about 25 percent in computer science. So we've got to get more women there. We're getting more Latinx now, but there are always these different areas. I'll give you just one example. We're very proud that 25 percent of our professional staff are black, but we need more Latinx and Asian mm -hmm. in that. You get my point. So specificity is very important. Yeah, I agree the one group we have not talked about that I want to bring up because we have a very strong LGBT group on our campus. I was going there next. Yeah, and we're very proud. <laughs> very proud of them with some poor, poor professors to chairs, and but we talk about those issues with the students, with the staff, and with the faculty because sometimes they are discriminated against, and we don't call it out. We don't we don't call it out, and we need to call it out to make sure we're being supportive of those students and faculty and staff. Yep, so put a pin in that because I'm coming right back. Um, last week, I had the opportunity to sit in a conversation on our campus for Black History Month, and it was called um, LGBTQ Health Equity. Mm -hmm. And you know, you really don't, you, you think about the challenges that the LGBTQ community has, but mm -hmm. it never registered that health equity, health equity would be one of those. So that was a very enlightening conversation. And when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, so far this evening, we've talked about race and we've talked about you know, gender as far as men and women go, but what can we do to make sure that, this L, that our LGBTQ community um, feels included as well? I, I'm very proud of our equity and inclusion initiative involving the office that's uh, it reports to our chief of staff, Candace Dawson Reed, but then there's an inclusion council, and we have faculty, staff, and students of different races, different religions, but also LGBTQ. I'm very proud, in fact, that the, the, the group is chaired by uh, an attorney uh, who is over the office and our dean of engineering, who's a gay man. And then we've got the chair of social work who is gay. We've got substantive LGBTQ representation there from faculty and administrators and students of different types. So, and when you can get that kind of, of um, that substantive representation from every group, and especially when you can have faculty in that inclusion council, right. okay, given the power of the faculty, it really does help to think, and then they have recommendations that involve everything from the curriculum to the, com to the representation to the ambience, to the culture of the of the institution. President West. It comes down to community, uh, yeah. really. And uh, we do have a, a, a very strong community uh, among our gay faculty. And I think that helps uh, to support the students as well. Very important. And different initiatives. I mean, it's been that, uh, interestingly, um, of the head of LGBTQ faculty and uh, Dean of Engineering, who helped us in recent years to uh, redistribute restrooms in terms of the gender issue with restrooms. And um, I've been very proud of the leadership they provided and of the campuses becoming more educated because you can have a lot of good people who just don't understand the issues. Yeah. And we, we've moved to another level now. And we were able to do it without a lot of fanfare, but in a very, very um, shared governance approach that worked quite well with restrooms in different buildings at different times and and moving to different floors the issues do and and uh, a lot of buy buy-in from our faculty and staff and students okay so with these with community and with these initiatives have you surveyed the students to to see how satisfied they are with you know their um with these initiatives and with the the sense of community we have a number of surveys regularly and uh just did another one uh, and because we did it with the Title IX and with issues involving that before a protest we had and after that, um, I think one of the great initiatives from years ago was when the faculty decided to have an outpage for mm. faculty and staff so that it was so that students would know people on the campus who were welcoming them into the office. And then the student affairs people and others did the same thing so that we could have people on the desk talking about, and then to see what students thought about that. So it has been, I have been very impressed with the welcoming environment of our college and about without getting feedback. I actually meet with the leadership of LGBTQ students and faculty, uh, and they give me that feedback of what's working well, 
what may not be working well, ways in which we can make it better. Yeah. Okay, that's refreshing. President in, White. In October of 2019, we embarked on a comprehensive campus climate study, yeah. which involved not just a survey, but focus groups and, and yeah. uh, all, all sorts of activities yeah. uh, to try to get at exactly this question. Fortunately, we were able to complete most of the focus groups before um, spring break in 2020 when we had to send everybody home. And we were able to do some of the surveying uh, even after uh, the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, but then, uh, we had a group of uh, faculty, students, and staff who went through a, a mountain of data and distilled that down to uh, about 18 uh, different recommendations uh, of the faculty based on prioritization of the, the information they got back uh, from our community. And so we've been working to knock those out uh, over the past uh, eight months or so. Yep, similar to us with including ex external consultants and large numbers of faculty, staff, and students involved in the process, which led to the Inclusion Council, which came up with a, a lot of recommendations that we're now beginning to implement. So, and with a lot of focus groups during the George Floyd period and other on those issues, uh, but um, a lot of faculty doing research on issues involving Asian discrimination, LGBTQ, these different areas, and, and using our research experts to help us in these town hall meetings and focus groups that we're having. Right. Thank you so much for that. Um, so the last, um, I think I'm going to go back a bit to curriculum. And this will be the last area that I touch on before we take the um, Q&A questions from Dr. Naylor. And so with curriculum, we talked about it, but I'd like to get more specific about how we can actually change curriculum um, to, to meet the needs of our diverse students, to include the students that we need to include. Um, and, and from the gambit, from a racial issue, from a, 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 um, the isms, <laughs> you know, the, the LGBTQ community, how specifically can we enhance curriculum to include this? The, the good news, Chuck, you go first, please. You go ahead, please. <laughs> I, I'm always, I'm, I'm so quick to talk. Go ahead, please, though. Yeah. Well, so I mentioned um, specifically uh, focus on projects and, and group work. Mm -hmm. And um, in the STEM disciplines in particular, there's been a long, long history of um, uh, these courses being weeder courses to, uh, to intentionally fail uh, a certain percentage of students out from uh, certain careers. And uh, there's been a over, an over-reliance on uh, a sort of Machiavellian uh, ethic uh, that you know, only the strong survive and a focus on individuals. And I think that's led to a lot of the problems that we see now um, as disciplines in chemistry and physics and, and other disciplines. Um, so I think working, um, focusing on group work uh, allows us to acknowledge uh, the uh, differences among people in the group, the collaboration that's necessary to be successful, and it uh, de-emphasizes uh, the individual in um, uh, succeeding uh, in, in a course. And, and so I, I think that's one of the ways in which we can um, uh, embrace diversity in the curriculum, at least in the STEM disciplines. You Do know, you think I, it's a, real quick, I'm, I'm sorry to, I just have a follow-up question. Um, so if we are taking the focus off the individual, how do we then assess the individual if all we're giving is, is group work? Well, not all that we're giving, but you know, in your, in your example, if that's what we're doing, how do we assess that the individual can, you know, function outside of a group? Well, I'm not suggesting that we get rid of exams entirely, but I, th I think we can de-emphasize them. Okay. And uh, by putting more of a focus on collaborative uh, activities, uh, I think that's a way of bringing everybody in, in the course uh, along uh, without having to focus on a need to fail 40% of the students. You know, so it, it, the, and the, the, what you're hearing, first of all, is um, a certain bent, a certain issue that you're hearing both of us bring up because we're so close to STEM in America. And people who are not in STEM may not be aware that the vast majority 
of students of all races who start with a major in STEM leave it. My study showed two thirds leave it. Um, literally, um, uh, it's it's eighty percent of blacks and Latinos, and but it's uh, literally about seventy percent of whites and sixty percent of Asians who start in science and engineering leave it primarily because they were not doing well. And that is, I mean, it, it, is, a, it is a crime. It, it, it hits all students. It's just that as often happens, students of color, for them, the, the problem is exacerbated. It's worse for that group. So, I mean, he is absolutely right. Again, look at, my, look at our Chemistry Discovery Center. It's a great example of group work uh, using uh, problems out of our biotech company, uh, companies on campus. But the grading, finally, you get a, you, there's a group grade. You get a grade for what you do in the group, but you also get the individual grade. And mm -hmm. it's because in STEM, but I would say in the social sciences, more and more problems are always solved with groups. It's not just the individual. If you look at publications, so often people are publishing with other people. And that is the future of knowledge. It seems that that group works, so it's important. So, but there would be two things I would say about curriculum. One involves performance of the students of color and other groups, first generation college students. Are we using analytics to understand who is succeeding right now? Who is succeeding and who is not succeeding? And what else do we need to do? That's, and that, as that's very hard because we know, I'm telling you, 40, 50% are not succeeding and a much higher percentage of students of, of color often. The other is more philosophical. And this is what really is in the hands of the faculty, of the professoriate. The fundamental question, the ineluctable question every university must ask is who are our students and who do we want our graduates to be? To what extent are they prepared to work with people from all kinds of backgrounds? Have they examined their own values uh, and decided that maybe everything their parents told them was not 100% the case, right? <laughs> You know, the, the great philosophical thing, the unexamined life is not worth living. I mean, that the idea, though, I often ask when my students are coming across the stage, I say, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You know, and the best answer I've ever gotten was, Doc, I'm going to change the world. I'm going to change the world, you know, which is such an inspiring answer. But I would say for the majority of students graduating from our colleges and universities, it is probably the case that they may not have had experiences to have the tough conversations. If they're in certain majors, in certain departments, with certain faculty, they do more of it. Yeah. But it's possible on any of our campuses for some people to come through and maybe not to have had the tough conversations about religion and race and everything else, either in or out of class. So I think we all have work to do. We have initiatives going on. Uh, Salisbury has its uh, National Democracy Center. We have our Center for Democracy. Those are the places where it's happening. But we're bringing in the congregation, people who want to be involved. You know what I mean? I mean, it's not, it's not always the case that everybody gets involved in those activities. So we are, as we think about what we are doing, all of us are doing a lot of work in service and yeah. civic engagement. Uh, and we've got the Carnegie Classification Salisbury. We're very proud of that. And that means a lot of our students are getting a certain level. Doesn't mean all, doesn't mean all. Somebody can come in thinking one way and leave that same way on <laughs> almost all of our campuses. And it's gonna take supporting our faculty to think about what else can we do with general education? As we think about what is it our students are learning? What is it we need them to learn? How do we make sure larger numbers are having the tough conversations? about race or gender or homosexuality, all these things that may or may not be comfortable to them. That is the question for American higher education as we think about the future. Final point, when I'm working with new presidents in the Harvard program and we're complaining about Congress, I always say, have you ever thought about it? All of these people in Congress are our graduates. They're our graduates, okay? And some we may be proud of, but there are a whole lot of them we don't want to claim because of that. <laughs> Now, some people laugh, some people don't, but think about it. All of our leaders at every level, I mean, 90 some percent came out of our institutions. And as much as we want the liberal arts to be the what takes us to another level, people can go through courses and still miss the point. T.S. Eliot said about somebody, they had the experience and missed the point. 
That's our challenge. How do we make sure people make the point, get the point? That's the challenge of the professor and of all of us. Yes, sir. President White, anything to add? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> he said, no. <laughs> Laura, go right ahead. All right. Uh, there's one group that we have not uh, discussed much tonight, and it focuses on disability and mobility. Yes. And when we discuss DEI, we also need to talk about these concepts as yeah. it relate to mobility and ability. Yes. How yeah. can we create spaces at universities that are inclusive of a learning environment that engages these students as well? Yes, yes. Let, let me just start by saying a part of our inclusion initiative does definitely involve those populations. From the hearing impaired, to those who have other challenges, including mobility. And um, we, we are able to get grant money, we have an office for it, and we talk about it to educate people about those issues. We all, on all of our campuses, we've had to work on, on physical mobility of things in restrooms and ramps and those kinds of things. But um, there is more sensitivity that we can be working on to educate people about what others go through when they have those. But our inclusion council does have that as one of the very important issues. The other group we have not mentioned today that we should mention is Native Americans. We do have Native Americans on our campuses. I think we've all worked to have the acknowledgement, the land acknowledgement, which is that very important. And I think, and so I think a part of the message today is we don't want to leave out the people who are hearing impaired or the people who may have challenges with mobility. Uh, and we don't want to meet, meet, bring, leave out another group such as Native Americans because the group is smaller. I mean, a part of being enlightened is to talk about those from our campuses who are descendants of that population. Those are two groups we should mention. And Thank veterans. you. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm really proud uh, to say that most of the uh, progress that we have made at Salisbury University in creating community for uh, people with disabilities has been the result of our students. Yeah. And um, one of our students, Will Fried, was is a nationally uh, known uh, advocate for uh, students with disabilities. And now he's uh, graduated from Sal Salisbury and, he, and he's in a graduate program. Um, but um, uh, it takes a lot of work uh, to create community uh, for people in all kinds of, of groups uh, and intersections of those groups. And uh, a lot of the work has, around here at least, has been done by students with the help and support of uh, staff members in the administration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lord, there was also one group um, that we didn't mention um, students with disabilities, I'm sorry, student with learning disabilities. Developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, we have a number of students who are on the spectrum. Um, it takes emotional intelligence for students to respect people, not only who may learn differently, but who may respond differently and talk differently. Because in ignorant environments, and I use that word on purpose, um, people can make fun of people who are different, which is awful, just awful. But teaching our students and all of ourselves that people can be different, can have so much to offer, and yet uh, respond more slowly or in a different way or not look at you, or um, amazingly sometimes have great memories and can say that there's just so many, uh, this, this diversity of the human spirit and mind is something so developmental disabilities um very very important and for us i mean a number of students are uh with on the spectrum now we have to decide um we have to evaluate every case to make sure it can work you can understand that but we do have a number of absolutely phenomenal students who are on the spectrum um uh, michelle alexander wrote a washington post piece about my meeting her son uh, and and uh, it was such a wonderful story in the Washington Post because he would he would not look at me as I was talking to him. And when he finished, when I finished, I said, now tell me what I said, because I was assuming he wasn't paying attention. He told he had a, he has a photographic memory before I knew it, he had told me exactly every point. All I could have was my mouth open, you know, 
But the good news was I had respected him in that process, but I learned, and over the years, as he was majoring in my major math, I learned so much from him. And that's the other point. We can learn from this, is what Chuck is saying about students, what they can teach us, uh, all of us, about these different groups. Okay. Are we ready for the next question? Yes. Okay. Um, this has to do with increasing student confidence. How do you recommend faculty in their classrooms help adult learners increase their confidence um, when they've come through a mindset, especially those in demographic groups that have been overlooked yeah. in their earlier classroom experiences, such as a in a difficult public school situation? So they're coming through a difficult K through 12 situation. They've been overlooked. How is how can faculty actually increase their confidence? Uh, this really requires a lot of sensitivity on the part of faculty um, to, to do that. And also, I would say a similar um, challenge exists with veterans, because veterans come to our campuses with a, mostly with a different kind uh, a set of expectations uh, of, of us. And frankly, we fail them uh, a lot of times. And so being able to uh, recognize uh, when when students have a certain set of expectations of us and helping to manage uh, their educational experience, um, in part by meeting their expectations, but in part by showing them how um, we might not be able to meet their expectations uh, in certain cases uh, is important. For adult learners, well, so I sometimes say about our students who come directly out to us uh, from high school, that part of the college experience is helping uh, people to make the transition from their parent's child to their child's parent. And, you know, it's, it's part of growing up. But with adult learners, there's a different challenge. They already have made that transition uh, to adulthood, and often they have careers and families and, and lives. And the challenge there is really more about um, helping to uh, adapt their educational experience to their existing lives, mm -hmm. and that that means through scheduling, uh, and it also and. And transportation, it means uh, being sensitive to child care issues, um, all sorts of things. So unfortunately, a lot of this falls into the laps of faculty uh, because um, they are on the front lines of the educational process. But we can support faculty through professional development in teaching them strategies for recognizing and dealing with uh, the expectations and different expectations of people in their classroom classes. I think he's absolutely right. The word community, I use that a lot in my TED talk and in my research, because it makes such a difference for different groups when you give them a chance to have others with them. So the, the idea for veterans, having that community of veterans, we have found makes a difference. And I know other campuses do too, and people to whom they can go and faculty, uh, somebody that faculty can look to when they have questions about that group. I'll give you an example that was really eye-opening for me. Uh, some of the veterans said in recent years that sometimes in classrooms when they're discussing issues involving war and they get to something involving people being killed, they look to the veteran to ask a question. And the veterans were saying that that was so terribly inappropriate because of the sensitivities they have about those issues. And if, but if you've not been, I mean, nobody did it on purpose. They thought they were going to somebody who'd had some experience, but it is not like that. And so it's, it, we, we had to really give support to people on both sides and understanding that we've got to understand that there's so many feelings veterans may have about war, about killing, about any of those things and not wanting to be looked to just like Black people don't like for you to look at them when you talk about black stuff. The worst thing you can do is say, well, what do you think, Freeman? You know, just because you're black. No, if I want to say something, I will. But don't look to me. Why are you looking at me? Where you look to the white people. Where... <laughs> I've had to say that in some rooms as presidents. I mean, I will speak up and you know I speak too much. But the fact is that people will sometimes look to the black or look to the one woman in the room, you know, and. And, and that's a part of our education that we need to give people. The other part, though, 
seems to me is that um, our women's center has been so helpful in bringing in grants and bringing more returning women into that circle and faculty work with the women's center to understand what women are going through. The final thing I would say is, and I know professors know this, building trust between a student and a person can make all the difference in the world because we can't lump all adult students together. We know that. Some have had great experiences and are quite confident. Others haven't been in a classroom in years and they're thinking, oh my God, I've forgotten everything, right? You know, I tell you what I say so often to adults when they say, I don't know if I should be back here because I haven't been in school in five years or 15 years. I say, listen, if you have raised children or dealt with life, you can do anything. You, you already have a PhD in life. This will be a piece of cake. I said, you're going to be surprised at how much you bring to the table, you know, and, and using that strengths based approach that the psychologists talk about to let them know, no, your experience matters. You will bring a different perspective. And I know I've seen faculty do that, can give that person that sense of, yeah, I'm supposed to be here. I can help some of these younger people. You know, it's that, but it's a great question, it really is. What Freeman talked about, um, one of the uh, attendees refers to as attacks on faculty of color and attacks on students of color as well yeah. uh, and, and from other groups. So, and, and it's real. Yeah. And, um, you know, whether you are the only woman in your department or the only black in your department or the only Latinx student um, in uh, your classroom, uh, that often uh, results in attacks uh, on you. And not attack, but T-A-X. Yeah, yeah, I get uh, it. But yeah. um, uh, I think as faculty, it's really important for us to be aware of that and uh, to, not uh, engage in turning always to a person uh, for that particular point of view. Yeah. And similarly, um, making sure that, you know, if people don't want to answer, they can just say, I'd rather not answer. And that's got to be okay. That's very good. I like that. I like that. You know, uh, I think as we get to know students, some students, I'm not saying that you can't look to a black student when talking about issue of race, but I think getting to know students better to see what they prefer really does make it all faculty to ask, you know, uh, would you would you be willing to engage in this conversation or can I ask you this question? But don't assume that's what I'm saying. Don't assume that somebody wants to be the point person. Sometimes people are ready. They're right. They really they, they want to do that. Oftentimes they don't want to be seen that with that tax that, OK, they get to race. So here I am. No, you know, you just got to get to those students well enough to know how they think about it. And it, and it is, but it's only human if you're, if you're a group of men and you're talking about a women's issue. Yeah, you got to look over at the women. It's just a human thing you do, but we've got to be sensitive to understand. No, don't put it on the spot. Let's just see. You know, it's very important. And just one example, I remember talking to a group of women in my society for women engineers, and they said, you know, there's so few of us in the class that when they have groups, they always want to have one woman per group so they can have the woman perspective. Well, sometimes we'd like to be the group, you know, the five of us, rather than splitting us up, you know, and I, I hadn't thought about that. And the professor hadn't thought about that. Then, you know, get a, get a sense from the women. Would they like to be in that group so they can give that perspective or do they want a chance to work as women as a group? It's, so it's, it's being open-minded enough to think about different approaches is what I would say. <clears throat> okay. All right, here is a follow-up question uh, to what President White had mentioned. Um, Smith and colleagues have researched racial battle fatigue on TWI campuses. As a faculty of color in higher education, I have also thought about this as a faculty of color tax. However, um, it can also be experienced by students, staff, and faculty of color, a tax paid on campus. What are your thoughts? As, as leaders about racial battle fatigue in the context of a HBCU and a TWI. Okay. For example, at Coppin, I am particularly interested in knowing if this phenomenon, racial battle fatigue is present in an inter-ethnic context on your campus. Yeah, this is just what we were talking about. And the, the, uh, the concept of the tax is, is a real one. And it's something that we have to be sensitive to. Uh, it's 
um, sometimes important to be able to get uh, the perspective of multiple people uh, in a group or in a classroom uh, on a particular issue. But when we over rely on some people for that perspective, then we do them a disservice. You know, the, if you look at the advanced program that focused on people of, of women, but we had a number of women of color, including blacks in that group, one of the phenomena now that led to the what we heard earlier about the small percentage, Dr. Tatum, of women professors is that it is the research will show, first of all, that women um, say yes to invitations and requests that they serve on committees and be very involved in the service. Often the guy is very comfortable saying, no, I got to get my research done, mm -hmm. you know. And the guys move up. That's just shown in any kind of institution from community colleges to MIT. You see the women doing more service and they, as a result, don't get all the rewards. And this is a generalization, but it's one that all the research is borne out. And so one of the things we started with the, with the NSF with the advanced grant was to say, let's teach young women that they don't have to always say yes to serving on a committee. Let's talk about clarity and expectations, Dr. Tim, that you mentioned. You know, and when, when is too much, too much? Because we see the women serving in administrative jobs and whatever, and they don't move up the ladder because they don't get a chance to do the other things to get to, to get to full professor, okay? Well, the same thing is true for people of color, for blacks and others. And so we've spent a lot of time with our affiliate groups, with the black faculty group, with the Latino faculty group, um, with the women's groups, looking at those issues and helping junior faculty learn how to say no how to say no and to get support from a chair in understanding why it's happening and in raising the point, look, look guys, look at who's doing all the service. It's the women. And if you don't have a one or two blacks, they want them to serve on every committee and nobody knows what other committee somebody else is asking about. And before you know it, they think they're helping the university, not knowing they're not gonna get all the work done. So yeah, they're fine for six years and then they're out of there. So we've had to, we have to, we believe in protecting young faculty starting with women and people of color, but also the young guys, but really pr protecting them to make sure they're not doing too much service. And then to listening to them talk about what they're experiencing, because it, there is a tax. I mean, having grown up at a time when it was a real tax, it's still in some ways now, um, it is a tax. And as we try to work with our students to say, we have to develop a toughness while teaching people to speak truth to power when it's an issue, both things have to be done. And the, but the other thing I'm going to say that I say to my students and faculty, there's something about working in communities that can put our experiences in perspective. And what do I mean by that? It's hard as hell being a black president. I'm just putting it out there because wherever I go, people want to know until recently. Now they think I maybe can do this. But for years, uh, is he in that job because he's black? You know, uh, is he fair to blacks and whites? You know, all kinds of stuff you get over the years. But and I'm not complaining, I'm just saying at every level you see that. But but I will tell you this. Our campus working with Baltimore City and, and bringing 500 children to campus, little boys and girls, first time offenders, puts everything else in perspective. It just does for my students and everybody else, because we see these children who need so much help. And while we may be taxed, they are overburdened poverty and those things. So we have to just put it in perspective. It's not to take away from the need to support faculty and make sure we take into account when they help us more. But I do think we in universities have a responsibility to that larger community, to issues of poverty and first generation and those things that can help us really see how fortunate we are. If you got a PhD, I don't care how taxed you are, you're truly blessed because it's only the top two or three percent of human beings. You know, I'm just putting it in perspective. That's all. One of the smartest things I did when I was an assistant professor trying to earn tenure was I went to one of my mentors and I said, you know, I know that um, this decision depends on uh, my performance in teaching and research and service, but I don't think those three count equally the same. Right. Right. I said, how much does it count? How do I know where to put my energy? And he, he was really honest with me. He said, yeah. well, uh, it's about 85% research and 15% mm -hmm. teaching and 0% service. Mm -hmm. So you should say no to all of the service requests unless it's in your best interest to do it. And <laughs> so that. 
That was, really that, was that was that University of Utah. Am I right? Is that where that yeah, was? That's what it was. <laughs> Every school is not quite like University of Utah as a major research university. First of all, don't give some people the wrong idea. Wait a minute. But I get your point. I do get your point. I think getting clarity from the department chair or a mentor. Uh, how do I balance these three things in a way? Who's taking ownership of my career? That's yep. what I would say to young people. Who's taking ownership of my career to make sure I'm getting the right mixture of the service, the teaching, and the other? Very important. Very important. Okay. We have one follow uh, one follow up on curriculum, and this has to do with ungrading. Um, and it says, we are doing some ungrading on uh, campus. How do you feel this helps with equity and diversity? And I know you all had mentioned earlier how important teamwork and collaboration is. So what about having assignments that are ungraded? I am so old school. Let me, let me just put it out there. I am very old school. No, students need to know where they stand. They really do. Because, you know, even when freshmen get C's and D's and you ask them how they're doing, they go, oh, I'm okay, I'm okay. Because <laughs> see, in high school, they never flunked it. They don't realize in college, it's real. When you have that D at the midpoint, and this is what we say in chemistry, in those kind of areas, if you got a D at the midpoint, it's over. Because you don't build it. The second half is built on the first half. You know, so you got to get that first half right. And if you don't, you're in trouble. And if you're not grading, you don't have the motivation to know. Now, I do think where we can help with equity and inclusion, how much support are we giving the students? How much supplemental instruction? How much tutoring? How much mentoring to make sure they learn how to study? Those are the kinds of things. But in real life, uh, whether you talk about pass, fail, or grades, you're going to be graded. You really are. In the first year, if it's about that work, that may, I mean, experimentation is fine to see what, but ultimately students have to come up to grade. I will tell you, I've been working with some universities that have literally been grading minority students with a different standard in that same class as some white students. And I had to say to them, this is an egregious case of racism because you don't tell a kid you got a B in chemistry when you know the grade is a C. I don't care what the race, because that's not getting them ready for med school. It just is not. And that's, they meant well. They say, well, but they haven't had the background. Well, let's think about a different approach. But let's not lie to students and tell them they got a B, because two things happen. The white kids know up, and more important than that, the black kid thinks, I'm good. I can go to med school. Well, no, you can't. You see what I'm saying? So at some point, that old school approach of the standard, but I would say two things, the standard with the grading, but the standard with the support. I want to know the kind of things Salisbury and UMBC are doing, that people are doing those things with the group work, with the mentoring, with the supplement instruction, with the tutoring, all those things so the student can get up to that level of a B. I think there is a, a role for ungrading, but um, I think it's a limited role. Yeah. And um, it brings to mind that years ago, uh, the University of California at Santa Cruz had uh, a whole system where there were no grades in the entire institution. Every student uh, was evaluated with a written evaluation by a faculty member. And uh, so it, it did away with uh, grade point averages and the whole thing. And they abandoned that experiment um, in part because the people who evaluate transcripts are lazy and they want to know what a B is and they can't, yeah. can't figure out what a, a narrative translates to in terms of a grade to make an admissions decision for graduate school. So um, as far as having um, uh, ungrading for uh, selected assignments, particularly group assignments, to create community, to get people started, to, to get uh, help people get their feet wet, yeah, I think there's a role for it. Um, but I'm kind of old, old school, like, uh, like <laughs> people may not like me, but I, but I'm loving those students and I want them to have, I want them to know where they fit what, you know, what I will say that we've been working on an in innovation and in a number of classes when it, when students need a B to go to the next level, I've been really impressed with some faculty who've had many masters in January to identify the concepts that the students didn't grasp to give them supplemental instruction and let them take a test on that part to see if it can be moved to a B. In other words, sometimes they don't need to retake the whole course. If they're, if it's 20% of the course they just didn't grasp, can you do something with the experimentation with that part, let them grasp it, then give them a test on that and let them move on with a B. Now, somebody said, well, that's not fair to the other students. And I'm saying, no, it's not about fairness in that way. It's about, does the student reach a standard? 
how can we help the student get up to that certain level? Either the student knows that work or the student doesn't. So that is one of the ways that we can help some students who may not be as well prepared so they don't have to completely retake courses when possible. Part of what you're hearing from two presidents who come from STEM fields is yeah. that in mathematics and chemistry yeah. and engineering, yeah. the yeah. curriculum is vertically integrated. Yeah. If you yeah. don't get the algebra, you're going to fail calculus. If you don't get the calculus, you're not going to be able to be an engineer. No. And so um, everything depends on the things that came before it. In some other fields, it's less important. And uh, I think that uh, we can have uh, room for experimentation in, in other fields much more easily. But let, let me say this as a former chair of the Humanities Council and as a teacher of a, uh, I mean, the son of an English teacher of my mother, um, uh, she would say there are layers of sophistication in language that, and that, um, well, he's right, you, there's a there's wiggle room, you know, if you have a test and, and it's a reading and writing test. You may be able to have memorized enough or do whatever to get to a certain level, but the levels of sophistication will continue to go up. There is a sequential level there also, and you, as you go up, you know, in, whether in history or in literature, it gets more. I like to use languages and music. As you, I'm a classical pianist, and I know I could not be doing Beethoven's Pathetique if I had basic levels of instruction before that. Uh, or more, more recently, when I told my students I was going to study French, they said, don't you think you're kind of old? And I said, bring it on. So four years ago, il y a un, quatre um, uh, j'étudie de la Francais, j'étudie la Francais avec mes étudiants tous les jours. And, and, and I love it. I'm studying j'étudie la uh, Madame uh, Simone du, de Beauvoir, Monsieur Hugo. I'm studying the French philosophers. And c'est très difficile, man. But here's the point. One layer, just like math. One layer, just I mean, you do not move on in languages if you don't have basic sentence structure and conjugation of verbs, like conjugation de la verbs, right? You know, and so there are layers in certain humanities and in the arts, in certain levels, in piano and in, you know, so I mean, while it's true, we tend to be a little more crisp in, in that either you're going to know that algebra and you're not going to get the pre-cal or cal, but in other humanities, there's, there's, a, there's a theme there that you would find also. I just didn't want them to say, Chuck, we didn't know anything about the humanities and the social. <laughs> think we can say that. I don't think that we can say that you gentlemen don't know much about much, right? <laughs> I think you have demonstrated that you all are um, just well versed in so many things and that you love your campuses and you love your students and you love your faculty. We have so many questions <laughs> in the Q&A section, but we have four minutes left. Um, Let's see, I am gonna go ahead and ask Lore for one more. So you guys have to practice the brief. You have to be yep, brief. Got it, got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're gonna try. Okay, Lore, go for it. All right. Um, so for those institutions on a shoestring budget, how can they advance and move forward with DEI practices? in terms of creating a framework in their institution. Noting that budgets vary widely uh, across institutions. A very quick answer. We put money on things that matter yeah. on any yeah. campus. I don't care what you say. We put some money, it may not be as much as another place, but when, we, when something matters, we put money into it. Straightforward, brief answer. Makes me very proud to be a, a president in the state of Maryland because Maryland cares a lot about higher education yeah. and compared to many other states is yeah. uh, very provides generous funding for higher yeah. education. Yeah. And, and so it's just a matter of prioritization. Yeah. If, if it really matters, then you're going to find the money. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Naylor, for um, your, your, um, Q&A assistance today. I appreciate that. Thank you to President White and President Probowski for your knowledge, your wisdom, your lessons learned, your insights. We are uh, 
unbelievably grateful that you guys could join us for two hours. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. I do. I want to say to the audience, thank you for joining us. We started out with about 80 or 85, but I guess people have to get to dinner and things like that. <laughs> so we had seven or some people, people to join a minute ago. They stayed. So get, get, yeah, they really they did. did. I'm and we want to thank that. Elizabeth. She told me I didn't know it was going to be a marathon, but this has been a marathon. <laughs> <laughs> well, you told us you told us to bring the hard questions, and we brought the hard questions. This is great. When this I was in great, that, folks. when I was in that uh, LGBTQ, I invited all of them to come and ask the hard questions. So yes, <laughs> thank you to my CUSIF representatives. Thank you to Elizabeth Brunn, the chair of CUSIF. Thank you to the XCOM of QCIF. That is Diane Flint. That is Ellen Schaefer Salins. That is me. <laughs> and um, thank you to Dr. Joe Bogman and Dr. Zakia Lee for their leadership. We so appreciate you. Thank you to the um, the Structural Equity Subcommittee that how oh I'm glowing that helped to um, to put all of this together. That's Dr. Naylor, Dr. Uh, Schaefer Salins, that's Dr. Lee, Dr. Ben Ara from uh, Bowie State. So uh, we have a chat, I'm sorry, we have a survey in the chat if you all wouldn't mind taking that survey so we can make the next one. We have one more planned so that we can make the next one better. Thank you so much. We appreciate all that attended. Thank you again to the presidents of UMBC and Salisbury University. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Appreciate it. Keep hope alive. You. Keep hope alive. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Au revoir. Au revoir. <laughs> Good night. That's Good night. the program.